The .NET Core podcast is supported by our listeners who have become patrons. To see a full list of the patrons, or to join them, head over to .netcore.show slash patrons. Hello everyone and welcome to the .NET Core podcast, the only podcast which is devoted to .NET Core, ASP.NET Core, EF Core, SignalR, and not forgetting the .NET Core community itself. I am your host Jamie Kaprogman taylor and this is episode 6, but what is Mono? In this episode I'm going to introduce the .NET ecosystem platform Mono, talk about how it's related to .NET Core, and where you might already be using it. So let's sit back, open up a terminal, type in .NET new podcast and let the show begin. I'll just take a moment to introduce myself to anyone who's new to the podcast. I've been using .NET Core since the first 1.0 release to manufacturer build, and I've been writing about it over at .netcore.caprogman.com for almost as long. At the time of recording this episode, that accounts for almost two years. I'm not a Microsoft employee, I'm just a person in the community who really digs .NET Core. In fact, it's the reason why I started this podcast. For a fuller introduction to me, why I started the podcast, and what I'm hoping to achieve with it, you should check out episode zero. I'll leave a link in the show notes. Be sure to check your podcatcher. The show notes for this episode will include a full transcription and some useful links, so don't forget to check them out. In this episode, we'll cover a little bit about Mono and how it relates to .NET Core. I've mentioned Mono on the podcast before, back in episode 1, which was a brief history on .NET Core. This episode will be a little bit more involved than the brief mention it got in episode 1 though. That's because you may end up leveraging Mono at some point as you start working with .NET Core. Mono, as we'll see, is an evolving product in the .NET ecosystem. As such, we'll probably revisit it a few times over the course of this podcast. Let's talk about Mono, right after this. So what is Mono? Back in episode 1, I introduced Mono by saying, In around 2004, a very, very smart engineer called Miguel de Acaza, I've probably butchered the pronunciation of his name, I do apologise. Anyway, he started a project called Mono Project. This was an attempt at making a cross-platform black box re-implementation of the .NET framework, specifically for Linux devices. That was both a TLDR, that means too long didn't read, and a pretty accurate explanation of what happened. Although, I did get one crucial part wrong. It wasn't an open source implementation of the .NET framework per se, it was an open source implementation of the common language infrastructure, which includes the .NET framework. As a quick reminder, the common language infrastructure is part of the tool chain that takes your IL compiled code and runs it on the common language runtime. The common language infrastructure includes the common type system, um, you can think of this as the base class libraries, uh, take a listen to the previous episode in this series for a little more information on what they are, metadata about your code, the common language specification, and the virtual execution system. Uh, this is effectively what runs your compiled application. All of that is an extremely brief overview of some of the things that the common language infrastructure includes. It has been standardized by both ISO as ISO IEC 23271-2012 and by ECMA as ECMA 335. Wikipedia describes it as the common language infrastructure describes executable code and a runtime environment that allows multiple high-level languages to be used on different computer platforms without being rewritten for specific architectures. As the CLI, not to be confused with the command line interface, I'm not going to mention the command line interface in this episode aside from just now, is designed to be platform agnostic, uh, in this case platform means operating system, it was only a matter of time before someone decided to create an open source implementation for Linux. Mono gained a lot of attention in the open source and Linux development communities, especially seeing as Miguel de Acalza was already pretty well known in the Linux community. If you've ever used the GNOME desktop environment on a Linux distribution, then you've used one of his projects. Both Miguel and Frederico Mena, again I've probably butchered his name, I do apologise, released the initial version of GNOME in 1999. Miguel formed a company, initially named Helix Code, but later renamed to Zimian, and it was through that company that he announced the Mono project. It gained so much traction that a whole year before version 1 of Mono was released, the company had already been bought by Novell. 
the first publicly available version of Mono was released in June 2004. It had full support for C-Sharp 1.0, which had only been standardised via both ISO and ECMA the year before. It was also followed by version 1.1 in September 2004, which had full support for C-Sharp 1.1. It would only take a further two years for Mono to align itself with the API and C-Sharp versions the .NET framework supported. Effectively, they were being developed and released at the same time. Along the way, the Mono team added their own APIs to the Mono stack too. Uh, we're talking Mono.Cecil, Mono.Cairo, Mono.Posix, for example. In January 2009, Mono 2.2 was released. One of the biggest features of Mono 2.2 was the inclusion of static compilation. This was their implementation of ahead-of-time compilation. This allowed developers to take their Mono projects, usually written in C-Sharp or VB, and compile their project down to the native code for their operating system. This allowed Miguel to say the following in a blog post from 2008. Another nice piece of technology that we showed at the PDC was static compilation, the feature behind allowing Mono to run on the iPhone in a fully legit way, with no jailbreaking. At this point in time, as it still is now, the iOS platform was a walled garden, meaning that you could only develop for iPhones or iPads using Apple hardware and the Apple-approved developer toolchain. But Miguel's team had gotten around this with their nascent platform. It was around this time that the Mono team announced the C-Sharp compiler as a service, which had support for C-Sharp 5 a full seven years before it was standardised by ECMA, and three years before Microsoft released support for it in the form of Visual Studio 2012. I would recommend giving both of the blog posts that I've just mentioned a read, as they are fascinating. Check the show notes for links to them. What happened next? The development of new features for Mono continued at a meteoric trajectory, that is until Attachment came along. In early May of 2011, Zimian's parent company Novell was acquired by Attachment. Shortly after this acquisition, Attachment started making layoffs. Some of these layoffs were key personnel in the Mono project, and the internet went wild with speculation as to the future of Mono. Stephen J. Vaughan Nichols said, De Akaza, who is usually very outspoken, has also not tweeted nor written on his blogs about the fate of Mono and his own future with Novell. My understanding is that all of the Mono team, approximately 30 individuals, have been let go. Miguel kept quiet until mid-May, at which point he announced a new company, Xamarin. Xamarin would be a commercial entity and would produce tools which would enable developers to create applications on iOS and Android using Mono. He also announced that We've been trying to spin Mono off from Novell for more than a year now. Everyone agreed that Mono would have a brighter future as an independent company, so a plan was prepared last year. To make a long story short, the plan to spin off was not executed. Instead, on Monday, May 2nd, the Canadian and American teams were laid off. Europe, Brazil and Japan followed a few days later. These layoffs included all the MonoTouch and MonoDroid engineers and other key Mono developers. So with a heavy dose of motivation from my music teacher, we hatched the plan. Now, two weeks later, we have a plan in place, which includes both angel funding for keeping the team together, as well as a couple of engineering contracts that will help us stay together as a team while we ship our revenue-generating products. Shortly after this, Attachment allowed the Xamarin team a perpetual license to use Mono and all related technologies that were created at Novell. Xamarin attained a perpetual license to all the intellectual property of Mono, Mono Touch, Mono for Android, Mono for Visual Studio, and will continue updating and selling these products. Miguel and his team could do whatever they wanted with Mono, and they did. It didn't take long for Xamarin to start creating new tools for developers, including Xamarin.Mac in 2012, which was a plugin for Mono Develop. In 2013, Xamarin Studio was released. This was a rebranding of Mono Develop along with integration into Visual Studio, allowing Windows users to write .NET Framework code and have it compiled for Android and iOS. In 2016, Xamarin was acquired by Microsoft for an undisclosed amount. This allowed Microsoft to ship Xamarin as a free tool within Visual Studio and to offer it as part of their new cross-platform tooling. Mono was also re-licensed as MIT. Why do I need .NET Core when I could use Mono? This is a very valid question. Indeed, it's a question that a lot of people asked when .NET Core had its first alpha releases, both as DNU and DNX. Well, for starters, Mono was originally designed to be binary compatible with the .NET framework. This means that while some of the underlying implementation details may be different, uh, Mono is, from a 10,000 feet view, the same as the .NET framework. Whereas to quote Dustin Metzger's book, .NET Core in Action, .NET Core's modular design means that you only include the dependencies that you need, and all of those dependencies go into the same folder as your application. 
deploying an application is now as simple as copying a folder. I definitely recommend reading this book, by the way. So if you only need to include system.io and system.collections.generics, for instance, then your code won't need the entirety of .NET Core to be installed or included with your application, whereas Mono requires the entire platform to be installed globally. Anyone who's ever had to maintain legacy servers with low hard drive capacity, let's say for our argument's sake around 100 gigabytes, will know the pain of having to install multiple versions of the .NET framework in order to support newer applications, especially if the applications that were already on the server required earlier versions of the .NET framework. You can very quickly run low on hard drive space. Of course, none of us have to support such servers in the age of the cloud, right? However, if you get into Blazor, which we'll talk about in a later episode, you will invariably end up using Mono, even if you don't know it. And the same can be said for Xamarin and Unity 3D. Because of that, it's worth knowing about. Well, at the very least, anyway. Wrapping up. We'll leave it there, I think. We've covered a lot of ground here, and most of it was unrelated to .NET Core. The Mono project has a wonderful history, and it's worth knowing about if you are serious about developing with the .NET ecosystem. Even if you don't know the history, it'll be worth knowing that Mono exists, and how we went from it to Xamarin. We covered what the common language infrastructure is, how that is related to .NET framework, and what Mono is, and how it came to be. You've probably used Mono and not realised it, especially if you've used Blazor, again we'll cover that in a later episode, Xamarin, or Unity 3D. Anyway, that's going to do it for this episode. Hopefully you found this interesting. If you did, then let me know by sending me a tweet at D-O-T-N-E-T-C-O-R-A-B-L-O-G or head over to the website .netcore.show D-O-T-N-E-T-C-O-R-A dot S-H-O-W and let me know what you think. Remember to check the show notes for a link to the full transcription of this episode and links to a bunch of related websites and resources. These are available at .netcore.show And don't forget to spread the word. Leave me a rating or review on your podcatcher of choice And come back next time for more .NET Core goodness. I'll see you again real soon. See you later, folks.